The technique of reinforcing the sewing on springback bindings isn't very complex. However, there are other aspects of sewing springback bindings that I wanted to cover in a video before starting a complete springback binding project. Springback bindings are rounded but not backed. Therefore, you don't need or don't want too much swell. So you have to manage the swell through the selection of thread size and the number of sheets per section and the thickness of the paper. And springback bindings tend to be quite thick books as well. Uh, for one thing, it's hard to make a very narrow spring. Alex Vaughan says, account books are made up of quires, 24 sheets. Therefore, a 10 quire demifolio will contain half a ream of ledger paper, making 400 and le 480 leaves or 960 pages. The number of sheets that are taken to form a section is an important consideration. For upon it depends the success of the binding, the governing factors being the size of the book and the thickness of the paper. Four sheets may be taken as a minimum number to a section to be used for handmade paper. Five or six may be used for machine-made papers, unless the books are extra thin or small in size. John Mason says, the number of sheets to a section depends on the thickness of the paper. Fools cap to demi up to 25 pounds are folded in sixes, demi 28 pounds to royal in fives and heavier paper in fours. If the sections are too thick, the book will start at the fore edge. If they are too thin, there will be excessive swell and the back will become too round. I'm making this book from A3 cartridge paper and I'm using six sheets per section. And there's going to be 24 sections. As you can see, I'm using a heavy one inch wide linen tape to sew on. It's a bit longer than I really needed. It needed to just extend the thickness of the book, which is quite thick, and maybe two inches. So it's a little bit long, but that's fine. We also notice that I'm not sewing on a frame. Mason says, the back is not sewn in and no sewing frame is required, as the tapes are stiffened and require no support. And Vaughan says the same thing, a frame is not used with this sewing as the stiff tapes do not require support. And this is supported by trade binders such as Peter Goodwin, who mentions it in his video. And I also saw evidence of this in a series of photos from the New South Wales Government Printing Office. Here the lady's sewing letterpress, and then the next photo she's another lady's sewing account books without a frame. And we finally reach the subject of the video. Now Mason says, to give additional strength to the sewing, the kettle stitches are usually reinforced by being worked round a double length of thread, which is inserted at each end when the first kettle stitches are made. So I've just found two short lengths of 18.3 linen thread from my scrap box, and I've made a loop out of it, and I'm going to tie the kettle stitch around it. Otherwise, the sewing is pretty much the same as sewing on tapes. I think both Mason and Vaughan suggest um, sewing around the tapes for the 
um, first and last sections. I only do that for the end papers. Now, Mason also suggests another method is to leave loose thread at both ends when the first section is sewn. And I'll sort of demonstrate that here. Um, and so instead of using my loop, I'll just show that you could potentially um, use the length of thread that I've left for sewing on the end paper and just pull up a loop and, and go around that. Another one that Arthur Green suggests is to push a loop of thread through the between the first and second sections. And that's sort of neat in that um, it doesn't have a, a tail hanging down. The only concern I have that with that is that um, it'll put pressure on that first link stitch and I sort of worry that it might um, cut through it so I don't use that either. My preferred method is just to simply use a, a loop of thread. Another interesting thing from Vaughan is attempts are sometimes made to increase the strength by sewing through the tapes instead of taking the needle round them. But the advantage is doubtful, for in this case it is not possible to pull the slips tight after any reduction in the swelling by hammering. I've actually seen examples of this in account books at the Queensland State Archives though it was only on the end papers and it was very confusing when I first saw it. Uh, I saw no detri detrimental effect to the particular books, uh, but it's not something that uh, I've bothered trying. So I'll just show this a few more times from a few different angles and I'll fast forward or skip most of the boring stuff. At the end I'll show a close-up of the one kettle stitch location, which I think looks pretty cool. I think one other advantage with this technique is that I think you do end up with um, more even tension in the sewing.
was happening to be up there. In the next few weeks, I'll do a series of videos on binding a complete spring back. It'll be a bit unusual in that it'll be small, it'll be notebook size, so A5 size, which is unusually small for a spring back. And it'll all be in cloth, so no leather. I thought that'd be a good starting point for someone wanting to learn how to do a spring back. I'm really enjoying the great feedback that I've been getting, so if you have any feedback for me, any questions, drop them in the comments field. And if you want to be notified of my future projects, just hit the uh, subscribe button and you'll hear about when I uh, release the uh, tutorial on doing a cloth-bound spring bag.